From these beginnings sprang the wonders of a flourishing Egyptian civilization that would last for more than 3,000 years. By the year 1386 BC, the Egyptian civilization was 2,000 years old and had been ruled by 86 pharaohs. It was in this year that a young and vigorous king by the name of Amenhotep III emerged to become ruler. By the reign of the pharaoh Amenhotep III, the Egyptian empire was very well established. There was a tremendous inflow of income, uh, especially for the royal house. And Egypt itself was very stable and prosperous. And so with Amenhotep III, you get the appearance of a really grandiose kind of material culture in Egypt, with huge temples, huge royal figures. His vast building projects were centered in the ancient city of Thebes. It was here that the pharaoh Amenhotep III embellished a magnificent temple dedicated to the god Amun, the Egyptian lord of creation. It signaled a peak of craftsmanship and artistic achievement for the Egyptian civilization. Its graceful columns and expansive court remain the pharaoh's masterpiece of elegance and design. On the west bank of the Nile River stand two imposing statues of Amenhotep III, known as the Colossi of Memnon. The 60-foot-high monuments are all that is left of the pharaoh's mortuary temple that once stood here. Standing beside him, dwarfed by his stature, is the image of Queen T, who was his wife and the mother of his son. From trading expeditions abroad and an abundant supply of gold from the mines of Nubia, Egypt under Amenhotep III enjoyed a time of wealth and great prosperity. The Egyptians have the leisure to start getting involved in a lot of theological speculation, uh, which leads to what the Egyptians considered a disaster. The disaster came in 1353 BC and took the form of a strangely shaped man who some believe was a heretic. The pharaoh Amenhotep III had been grooming his oldest son for the throne when the young prince died. This left his younger brother, Amenhotep IV, to succeed their father. He had been studying religious matters, however, not affairs of state. As a result, his reign was a revolutionary departure from the long entrenched traditions of Egyptian kingship. Scholars still struggle to understand this pharaoh. Was he a fanatic or a great reformer, a visionary or a madman? Whatever the answers, he was without question the strangest of all the pharaohs. For over 1,700 years, the Egypt of the pharaohs had worshipped many gods. Amenhotep IV wanted Egypt to follow only one god, the sun god called Aten. As if to complete the transformation of Egyptian religion, the pharaoh changed his name from Amenhotep to Akhenaten, which meant servant of the sun god Aten. It was the first time in history that mankind worshipped a single god. This radical change rocked Egypt to the very clay of its ancient foundations. Akhenaten's reign was one of the great crisis points of Egyptian history. It was a period during which the old beliefs were overturned, the capital was moved, and the temples and cults were essentially shut down. This can't have been easy for the population. The massive temple complex of Karnak at the ancient capital of Thebes remains the largest religious site in the world. It was here in 1350 BC that Akhenaten was crowned pharaoh in a traditional ceremony.
But then tradition ended, great changes were on the horizon. They began with the Pharaoh Akhenaten's expansion and beautification of the Temple of the Sun at Karnak. Most notably, he added a new symbol to the temple. This curious disc was called the Aten. It was designed to symbolize his new god of the sun. In year five of his rule, Akhenaten proclaimed the Aten Egypt's one and only god. Akhenaten has occasionally been called history's first monotheist, in that he did away, or at least no longer funded, the worship of all the other gods in favor of only one, the Aten, or the physical disk of the sun. His choice for queen was also unconventional. Her name was Nefertiti. She came from a non-royal bloodline, but appeared to hold a very prominent position in her husband's reign. One of the most magnificent pieces of sculpture ever unearthed in Egypt is a limestone bust of Akhenaten's legendary queen. Nefertiti appears to have been an exquisite queen, but when we examine images of Akhenaten, we discover that his appearance was as bizarre as his ideas. Early on, many representations of Akhenaten caused a great deal of confusion among archaeologists. Because he was often portrayed with wide hips, a protruding belly, and breasts, he was sometimes mistaken for a woman who may have been masquerading as a man. It seems possible. Years earlier, Queen Hatshepsut was often portrayed as a male. She even went as far as to wear the false beard reserved for kings, perhaps to appear more like a pharaoh. Akhenaten's physique has sometimes been attributed to an illness called Froelich syndrome which causes the body to distribute fat in ways that are considered typically female. One of the side effects of the disease is that you are sterile, and we do know that Akhenaten and Nefertiti had uh, several daughters, and there is some speculation, obviously, that uh, Tutankhamun was a son of his as well. Uh, so if uh, that's the case, then the idea of this one type of disease probably is not likely. But Akhenaten's mummy has never been found. All attempts to diagnose his abnormal appearance have been based solely on art and statues. Other scholarly opinions about Akhenaten's startling appearance look not to medicine for explanation, but to the symbolism tied to his new religion that was based on the Aten sun god. Akhenaten's new religion was a radical departure for Egypt, but so strong was his conviction that he was willing to defy and eliminate the powerful religious institutions which represented the beliefs of virtually the entire population. He shut down the temples of the god Amun and declared Thebes would no longer be the foremost city of Egypt. A new capital city dedicated solely to his religion would be built. The pharaoh called his new city Akhetaten, which meant the horizon of the sun god. At the center of the new capital was the great temple. It was there that the pharaoh Akhenaten cultivated his new religion, devoted to the adoration of the sun god he called Aten. Before Akhenaten's religious reformation, Ordinary people worshipped outside the temples, while the king, priests, and the elite of society performed their rites inside mysterious secret chambers. Akhenaten changed all that. He wanted the people to worship along with their pharaoh, out in the open, under the sun's life-giving rays. It is believed that three ceremonies a day were held at the great Aten temple, the first was at dawn, as the sun rose over the cliffs east of the city. A second ceremony was held at noon, when the sun was directly overhead. Then at sunset, 
the devoted would recite a hymn to the sun which Akhenaten himself had composed. It is not known how successful Akhenaten was in converting his subjects to belief in the Aten. It is possible his new religion was simply a ploy to strengthen his image as a pharaoh. By eliminating other gods, Akhenaten knew he would appear more like a god himself. The king was removing the intermediaries, the clutter of all the intermediate priests, the uh, very bulky and cumbersome pantheon with hundreds of different deities and so forth with a simpler form of the religion. But it was mainly involved with the idea of the king creating a more direct support for the idea of him as a living divinity here on the earth. Akhenaten did not conduct this worship alone. There is evidence that his queen, Nefertiti, led the sunset ceremony each day. Nefertiti was a very important woman. We're not quite sure whether it was Akhenaten who, who granted her some of the importance that she had, uh, or whether she just decided to take it. There are some scholars who felt all along that Nefertiti was behind the religious revolution even more than her husband. Another powerful woman of this era was Akhenaten's mother. Her name was Queen T. She had migrated with her son to his new city to act as his regent. Because Akhenaten was absorbed with matters of religion, it appears Queen T may have been responsible for affairs of state. If so, there remains a puzzling archive of clay tablets that were sent to the pharaoh Akhenaten they came from outposts of the Egyptian empire in Syria. The tablets reported that the outposts were under attack and failing. These writings, known as the Armana letters, pleaded for supplies to be sent and promised continued loyalty in exchange. It is likely earlier pharaohs would have responded with soldiers and strategy. In this case, however, it seems Queen T may have been the one who ignored these pleas for help. Art from this period also underwent a radical change. Everywhere the pharaoh's image appeared, he was shown to be under the protection of the sun's rays. While previous pharaohs were depicted as being physically perfect, Akhenaten instructed the royal artisans to picture him more realistically. Instead of looking like a warrior, his statues portrayed him as feminine. And he was seen being tender with his children or in poses with Nefertiti that would have seemed far too intimate just a few years before. Akhenaten and Nefertiti ruled together for 12 years, and then, curiously, there is no record of the queen after that. The disappearance of Nefertiti is one of the great mysteries of Akhenaten's reign. After being such an integral part of her husband's kingship, almost a co-regent, suddenly there are no more mentions or depictions of her to be found. The reasons for this are still in debate. Some believe she may have died during childbirth. At one time, it was believed she was indiscreet in some way and Akhenaten disposed of her. Still, others suggest that she lived on past Akhenaten's interest in the sun. Nefertiti could have, in fact, been the more devout of the two and cloistered herself away to remain loyal to the cult of the Aten. But the, the general, the basic situation seems to be that she actually died. And there is evidence that she was buried in the royal tomb at Amarna, in the, what is called the royal wadi, beyond the confines of the royal city. In any case, Akhenaten did not have to suffer from a lack of companionship. He appointed a new male co-ruler. His name was Smenkara and some believe he may have been the pharaoh's younger brother. 
it is possible that he married one or more of his daughters. If he did that, that would not actually be unusual for a pharaoh. But in the case of uh, Akhenaten, we also have a suggestion uh, that he had a homosexual relationship with uh, his co-ruler, Smenkara, towards the end of his uh, reign, uh, which would make uh, Akhenaten one of the first bisexual people, presumably, since he also has children from Nefertiti. His unorthodox appearance and descent from the old religion caused history to label him a heretic. Still, there is little evidence that the pharaoh Akhenaten's new sun cult ever really took hold among ordinary people. Excavations of the ancient city of Akhenaten have revealed that even before his death, many of the inhabitants kept idols of the old gods in their homes. Were they ignoring the new religion or did they sense the inevitable? Akhenaten's religion was failing. Akhenaten died in 1334 BC, during the 17th year of his reign, and with him died his religion, based on the worship of the sun disk. Soon after, there was a tremendous backlash against his religion and heresy, which led to the destruction of anything that bore his name. It is believed, however, that in order to protect his remains, Akhenaten's followers removed his body from its tomb at Amarna. It was an Egyptian custom to uh, gather together and to try to hide and conceal and protect for, for, for the future uh, the remains of important pharaohs and burials. And I think there's a strong possibility that that's what did happen and that it remains to be discovered for archaeologists in the future. With the heretic Akhenaten dead, Egypt prayed for a strong pharaoh to restore its faith and reassure its people. Instead, this burden fell upon a boy just 10 years old. Behind the great cliffs of Dar el Bahari in the mountains west of Thebes lies a golden landscape formed in primordial times when floodwaters from the Nile cut through the earth, leaving a series of gullies and dry stream beds called wadis. It is within these canyons, in a place known as the Valley of the Kings, that the Egyptians of the New Kingdom buried their departed pharaohs. It was here, on a balmy afternoon in 1922 AD, that a modern-day discovery saved the legacy of a minor pharaoh from being lost in the sands of time. From evidence recovered, it was learned that this king, named Tutankhamun, was the son of the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten. This may explain why so little was known of Tutankhamun before this finding. When the Egyptians tried to erase the memory of Akhenaten, they may have also tried to erase the memory of his son. The list of kings inscribed on the walls at Abydos curiously omits Tutankhamun's name along with Akhenaten's. This has led scholars to ponder the question, who was the pharaoh Tutankhamun? He was born and raised in Akhenaten's capital city at Amarna. His birth name was Tut Ankh Aten, which meant living image of the sun god. But with the death of his father, the old religious beliefs and the cult of Amun were reinstated. Accordingly, he removed the Aten from the end of his name and replaced it with Amun to become the legendary boy king Tutankhamun. His new name meant image of the god of life, Artifacts exist which depict him as a robust king attacking Nubian and Syrian enemies. But experts believe it's unlikely that young Tutankhamun was ever actually involved in any military campaigns. Such responsibilities were probably handled by an experienced general named Horemheb. He was an ambitious warrior. 
Egypt inscriptions identify him as commander-in-chief of the army and deputy of the king. Horam Heb had served as military commander for the two pharaohs that preceded Tutankhamun. It was his mission to reassert Egypt's military might and restore respect from its neighbors. Were there others in this boy king's court that also wielded great power? It seems that a boy suddenly thrust upon the throne of a great empire would need senior officials for advice and guidance. The question is, was Tutankhamun just a puppet for the real power behind the throne? Perhaps the answer lies with a member of King Tutankhamun's court who overshadows everyone else. He was the king's vizier and high priest called I. A skilled and determined civil servant, his name meant divine father. Scholars believe it is I, along with Horemheb, who were responsible for the stability of Egypt during this time. Horemheb and I, between them, are adherents to the ancient god Amun. It is they, principally, who discard this new religion of the Aten, and the court and the religious focus is moved back to ancient um, Thebes, modern Luxor. Although, of course, naturally, all the inscriptions extol the virtues of Tutankhamun, but, of course, it's the bureaucrats, the civil servants, the general, Horemheb, the high priest I, who are essentially running the country, rubber-stamping everything. To what extent any pharaoh was involved in the day-to-day -day business of foreign and domestic affairs still puzzles experts. Egypt had a fully developed bureaucracy of administrators and scribes. The pharaoh was a figurehead, both royal and religious. Tutankhamun, like the other kings before him, had much of his life orchestrated around certain routines and ceremonies designed to reinforce his stature. The king, as a person, is hedged around with royal symbolism. Um, he has people watching him from the moment he gets up to the time he goes to bed. So to a great extent, his life is simply circumscribed by that. He might have found state affairs, in fact, quite onerous, putting on those heavy crowns and, and all that regalia, and look forward to the time that he could simply take them off and uh, go off and play with his friends. Tutankhamun had a queen. She was two years older than he was. It appears Akhenaten was the father of both. This made the pharaoh's bride also his half-sister. Her name was Ankhesen Pa'aten. We do know that she was very important to him. They were married when they were fairly young. From the representations, we see that she sits nearby him. Uh, she seems to take an active interest in some of the things that he was doing in hunting and fowling and fishing. With the old religion of many gods now reinstated, the reign of King Tutankhamun seemed destined to be a period of rebirth and renewal for Egypt. But then, at about the age of 20, the young pharaoh suddenly died. Some believe he was murdered. Forensic analysis of his mummy shows that he died of damage to his cranial cavity. This suggests a blow to the head. Further examination reveals a small hole in his skull. Scholars have constructed theories as to how it got there. One is that he was thrown from his chariot, but that seems highly unlikely because of the nature of the damage to the skull. Others that someone crept upon him in the night and thrust a small pointed object into the brain and therefore did away with him in a silent and stealthy manner. And still others that he might have died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Was there a conspiracy to murder the pharaoh? Some believe the damage to Tutankhamun's skull didn't occur until after he was dead. It is known for a fact that embalmers were not very careful. And there have been evidences of um, spare legs that are in coffins. And in some cases, um, in order to make sure that 
a, an individual fit into the coffin and the toes were cut off. Uh, in Tutankhamun's case, it's also clear that the embalmers were not very careful. So my guess is that the uh, damage that was done to the skull was probably uh, the embalmer's fault and not a cause of death. The short reign and sudden death of the young king did not allow enough time to finish a proper royal tomb. This is probably the reason that his burial site ended up hidden from plunderers through the ages. The entrance had been obscured by rock chips dumped during the cutting of a later king's tomb. The treasures found in Tutankhamun's tomb have awed the modern world. Up until their discovery, men could only imagine how Egypt's once brilliantly colored temples and artifacts would have appeared in ancient times. The contents of the young pharaoh's tomb reveal the true opulence and splendor of the era. But were the riches chosen to accompany this relatively minor ruler into eternity only a hint of what had been buried in the tombs of the truly great pharaohs? Some historians have suggested that we should not assume the larger tombs were filled with even more treasure. The pharaoh Tutankhamun's burial may have been richer than most. The people may have been grateful to him for the restoration of the old religion, or there might have been an emotional outpouring for someone that died so young. The untimely passing of the king not only caught the royal tomb builders unprepared, but it left Egypt once again without an heir to the throne. Sadly, there is evidence the young royal couple tried to perpetuate their bloodline. Two mummified fetuses were found in Tutankhamun's tomb that are almost certainly the remains of stillborn daughters. Although it is only a theory, some experts speculate that inbreeding may have been one of the many factors including disease, politics, and warfare, which contributed to the decline of other kingdoms. In Tutankhamun's case, inbreeding may have rendered his children too frail to survive. With no heir in line to inherit the kingship, the throne was passed to Ai, Tutankhamun's closest advisor or vizier. Records show that right after he died, I prepared to marry Tutankhamun's young widow to help justify his assumption of the throne. There is evidence that she suspected I was responsible for her husband's death and tried to avoid this marriage. Desperate, the widow Ankes Enamun sought help from outside of Egypt. She turned to a land in the east controlled by the Hittites and wrote to their king. Send me one of your sons. You have many that I may marry one, and he shall become king, for I have none here whom I may marry. He did send one of his sons to be married to Ankes and Amun and become pharaoh of Egypt. But consider the bureaucrats. Horemheb was the general in charge of the army. I was the chief high priest. Curiously enough, the Hittite prince got as far as the borders of Egypt, and he was murdered. I married Tutankhamun's widow in 1325 BC and became pharaoh before the deceased king's burial had been even completed. We know this from a painting in Tutankhamun's tomb. It depicts I already wearing a king's blue crown while he performs a ceremony during Tutankhamun's burial. Of course, it is possible that I was just the logical choice to assume the throne after young Tutankhamun died heirless. But there is one more suspicious aspect in the archaeological record from this time. Right after I ascends to the throne, there is no more mention of the young queen, Akasenamun. She disappears. 
Was she the next victim in this 3,000-year-old conspiracy? I reigned for only four years, and like Tutankhamun, had no heirs to carry on the 18th dynasty. Soon the throne of Egypt would belong to a new dynamic bloodline of kings. Among them would be the greatest of the pharaohs. He would usher in a period of building and expansion never to be equaled, and he would take the image of the pharaoh as a god to the extreme. The city of ancient Thebes. The pharaohs of Egypt were drawn to this landscape that lay along the banks of the Nile River. Queen Hatshepsut had embellished it with an obelisk that bore her name. Amenhotep III had built a grand temple to its patron god, Amun. Thebes' southern location was a natural choice for the capital city of a country that was expanding downward toward the rich territory of Nubia. The pharaoh Tutankhamun had moved the royal court back here before he died, and his vizier, Ai, had remained at Thebes during his brief reign. In 1321 BC, the general called Horemheb proclaimed himself to be the pharaoh of Upper and Lower Egypt. His name meant Horus in jubilation. Horus is Egypt's hawk-headed deity, a bird of prey, the god of the kings. Horemheb came to the throne after a long and distinguished military career which began four administrations earlier, when Amenhotep III was king. He was later appointed the great commander of the army by Akhenaten, and under King Tutankhamun, he was given the title of the king's deputy. Little is known about Horemheb's heritage. He was not from a royal bloodline and therefore had no claim to the throne. He remedied that by marrying Nefertiti's sister, thus creating a feeble link to the bloodline of the kings. Already middle-aged, Horemheb immediately set out to restore Egypt to its status prior to Akhenaten's heresy. At Thebes, he reopened the temples of Amun, but to avoid a power struggle with the priesthood, he appointed priests from the army. Since he was a military man, he felt they could be trusted. After this, Horemheb initiated the destruction of the great temples to the sun disk built in Amarna by Akhenaten. He used the thousands of stone blocks he removed as filler inside the pylons and walls of his new building projects. But his efforts to erase all traces of Akhenaten's reign ended up having an ironic twist almost 3,000 years later. The result is now, of course, many thousands of years later, as uh, archaeologists work to uh, restore and study these monuments, what do they find? They find these thousands of temple blocks that Haram Heb thought he'd buried forever, and uh, since they've been buried all these years, uh, these scenes depicting Akhenaten and his cult are actually much better preserved than any of the scenes which depict Horemheb. Horemheb also usurped many of the statues and monuments of his immediate predecessors. This was done by simply replacing their names with his. Two statues at Karnak are labeled with the name of Horemheb but most Egyptologists believe the facial features are similar to Tutankhamun's. While to us, this may seem to be the epitome of egotism, this practice was not uncommon for many of the pharaohs. The Egyptians uh, might have not put such a negative spin on it, and they might have uh, considered it more of recycling, but it was also a royal prerogative in a way, because when a king took over, uh, he became divine, and therefore, since the office had always existed, then he and that office would always have been 
around and would always exist. It was a right and a privilege that the reigning monarch had. Oram had ruled for almost 30 years, but when he died in 1306 BC, he, like Tutankhamun and I, was cursed by not having an heir. To avoid the chaos caused by a fight for succession, Oram had nominated his trusted vizier for the job. This pharaoh took the name of Ramses. He would begin the 19th dynasty, one of the greatest periods of Egyptian history. Ramses had been a career army officer and was probably in his 50s when he became pharaoh. Ramses planned to continue rebuilding Egypt, but his reign lasted only two years. He did manage to accomplish something his three predecessors had not. Ramses produced a male heir to inherit the throne. Ramses' son was Seti I. He had been the vizier and troop commander during his father's brief reign. After inheriting the throne, Seti gave himself the additional title of repeater of births to signify the beginning of a new era. During his time as pharaoh, Egyptian art and culture flourished. Tremendous building projects were also undertaken. At Karnak, Seti enhanced the building of the great hypostyle hall here in the temple of Amun. He also began to repair and augment the religious sites at Abydos. These efforts helped him to legitimize his non-royal bloodline's claim to the throne. Abydos was the ancient center dedicated to the cult of Osiris, the god of the dead. It was originally built in the Old Kingdom and had since fallen into disrepair. The temple Seti the first built for himself at Abydos is considered one of the masterworks of the era. Inside, his likeness is depicted alongside many of the gods of Egypt. It is believed that the gods actually dwelled within the temples which were dedicated to them. The wall reliefs here are considered some of Egypt's finest. They were carved with great precision and in the more difficult raised technique instead of the more common and quicker inscribed carvings. Seti was also the pharaoh who had the list of kings inscribed in his temple at Abydos. It not only honored those who came before him, but also elevated Seti into their ranks. The name Seti means he of the god Seth. Seth was the deity of storms and war. Seti lived up to his name on the battlefield. He has grown up with the army. It's, it's a totally different attitude to life and certainly to royalty and the higher echelons. He fights incredible campaigns year after year against the Syrians. Amongst his great foundations was, in fact, the temple at Karnak. And on the north wall, you find these incredibly long and huge reliefs of Seti attacking fortresses, destroying the enemies of Egypt. He's a mighty warrior. In 1278 BC, Seti I died after reigning for an extremely productive 13 years. He was originally buried in a tomb prepared for him in the Valley of the Kings. But to protect Seti's remains from grave robbers, his mummy was later removed and taken to a hiding place, dug high into the cliffs above Queen Hatshepsut's temple at Dar el-Bahari. Slightly over 100 years ago, in 1881, archaeologists unearthed this tomb. It revealed a remarkable collection of over 160 mummies known as the Royal Cache. Seti I was among the pharaohs discovered. His is the finest example of all the existing royal mummies. 
during his lifetime, Seti's primary queen was a woman named Tuya. Like her husband, she was from a non-royal family with a military background. Their first son died, their second child was a daughter, but their third child was a boy destined to become Egypt's most celebrated ruler. The dog star Sirius is the brightest in the Egyptian heavens. Each year, it disappears around the beginning of May to reappear about the 18th of July. To the ancient Egyptians, its return signaled the new year and the time for the annual Nile floods that would leave behind a new layer of fertile soil. One year during Seti's reign, the floods were particularly high. Egyptian legend told that this was the good omen that announced the coming of the next ruler of Egypt. This was Ramses II. Ramses II has become the name that is almost synonymous with Pharaoh but it may have been Seti's careful preparation of his son, the crown prince, which really predestined Ramses' success. Ramses II was probably one of the best prepared pharaohs in Egypt, because by the time that he came to the throne, they really uh, had a fairly regular process of making sure that all the senior royal princes uh, had a lot of experience in military affairs, in governance, so when they came to the throne, they were already uh, experienced and effective in what a pharaoh needed to be. By the age of 15, Ramses was already accompanying his father on military campaigns. By 22, he led his first command to put down a small revolt in Nubia. He also ambushed Mediterranean pirates who were searching for plunder along the mouth of the Nile. By the time Seti I's reign was coming to an end, his son had already proven himself as a military leader and worthy of kingship. Possessed with unmatched vision and self-confidence, the future king was poised to leave his indelible mark on the history of Egypt. One of the most magnificent pieces of sculpture ever unearthed in Egypt is a limestone bust of Akhenaten's legendary queen. Nefertiti appears to have been an exquisite queen, but when we examine images of Akhenaten, we discover that his appearance was as bizarre as his ideas. Early on, many representations of Akhenaten caused a great deal of confusion among archeologists. Because he was often portrayed with wide hips, a protruding belly, and breasts, he was sometimes mistaken for a woman who may have been masquerading as a man. It seems possible. Years earlier, Queen Hatshepsut was often portrayed as a male. She even went as far as to wear the false beard reserved for kings, perhaps to appear more like a pharaoh. Akhenaten's physique has sometimes been attributed to an illness called Froelich syndrome, which causes the body to distribute fat in ways that are considered typically female. One of the side effects of the disease is that you are sterile, and we do know that Akhenaten and Nefertiti had uh, several daughters, and there is some speculation, obviously, that uh, Tutankhamun was a son of his as well. From these beginnings sprang the wonders of a flourishing Egyptian civilization that would last for more than 3,000 years. By the year 1386 BC, the Egyptian civilization was 2,000 years old and had been ruled by 86 pharaohs. It was in this year that a young and vigorous king by the name of Amenhotep III emerged to become ruler. By the reign of the pharaoh Amenhotep III, the Egyptian empire was very well established. There was a tremendous inflow of income, uh, especially for the royal house. And Egypt itself was very stable and prosperous. And so with Amenhotep III, you get the appearance of a really grandiose kind of material culture in Egypt, with huge temples, huge royal figures.
His vast building projects were centered in the ancient city of Thebes. It was here that the pharaoh Amenhotep III embellished a magnificent temple dedicated to the god Amun, the Egyptian lord of creation. It signaled a peak of craftsmanship and artistic achievement for the Egyptian civilization. Its graceful columns and expansive court remain the pharaoh's masterpiece of elegance and design. On the west, as a result, his reign was a revolutionary departure from the long entrenched traditions of Egyptian kingship. Scholars still struggle to understand this pharaoh. Was he a fanatic or a great reformer, a visionary or a madman? Whatever the answers, he was without question the strangest of all the pharaohs. For over 1,700 years, the Egypt of the pharaohs had worshipped many gods. Amenhotep IV wanted Egypt to follow only one god, the sun god called Aten. As if to complete the transformation of Egyptian religion, the pharaoh changed his name from Amenhotep to Akhenaten, which meant servant of the sun god Aten. It was the first time in history that mankind worshipped a single god. This radical change rocked Egypt to the very clay of its ancient foundations. Akhenaten's reign was one of the great crisis points of Egyptian history. It was a period during which the old beliefs were overturned, the capital was moved, and the temples and cults were essentially shut down. This can't have been easy for the population. The massive temple complex of Karnak at the ancient capital of Thebes remains the largest religious site in the world. It was here in 1350 BC that Akhenaten was crowned pharaoh in a traditional ceremony. But then tradition ended, great changes were on the horizon. They began with the pharaoh Akhenaten's expansion and beautification of the Temple of the Sun at Karnak. Most notably, he added a new symbol to the temple. This curious disc was called the Aten. It was designed to symbolize his new god of the sun. In year five of his rule, Akhenaten proclaimed the Aten Egypt's one and only god. Akhenaten has occasionally been called history's first monotheist, in that he did away, or at least no longer funded, the worship of all the other gods in favor of only one, the Aten, or the physical disk of the sun. His choice for queen was also unconventional. Her name was Nefertiti. She came from a non-royal bloodline, but appeared to hold a very prominent position in her husband's reign bank of the Nile River stand two imposing statues of Amenhotep III, known as the Colossi of Memnon. The 60-foot-high monuments are all that is left of the pharaoh's mortuary temple that once stood here. Standing beside him, dwarfed by his stature, is the image of Queen T, who was his wife and the mother of his son. From trading expeditions abroad and an abundant supply of gold from the mines of Nubia, Egypt under Amenhotep III enjoyed a time of wealth and great prosperity. The Egyptians have the leisure to start getting involved in a lot of theological speculation, uh, which leads to what the Egyptians considered a disaster. The disaster came in 1353 BC and took the form of a strangely shaped man who some believe was a heretic. The pharaoh Amenhotep III had been grooming his oldest son for the throne when the young prince died. 
This left his younger brother, Amenhotep IV, to succeed their father. He had been studying religious matters, however, not affairs of state. 